It's midnight on the Gold Coast. It's 2 p.m. in the Kingdom. And you're listening to the Cross League Podcast. Hello and welcome to the fourth Cross League Podcast. In this one, we'll be talking mainly about scale acquisition, but just... Uh, from the off, uh, we'll just talk about uh, some of the, the latest happenings in Cross League. Um, the most positive news really is we're, we're moving towards the start of, of the new season. Um, weather permitting, I know the weather is, is pretty bad as we record this in the UK. Um, uh, we did start with our, our uh, bi weekly meetings with the, um, with the Cross League steering group, which yielded some positive results. Uh, it is great, really, to have um, more voices and different opinions. Uh, I think that's probably one thing that uh, we're glad of and we'd like to see more of. Uh, so I'll just uh, say hi to Des because I haven't done that yet. So, Des, how are you? Hello. Yes, I'm good, thank you. Yeah. Did you enjoy the meeting the last day? Yeah, very good. It's good to, like you said, It's. Uh, I think sometimes it's been me and you speaking to one or two people and uh and the rfl and one or two people at the rfl uh just have that sort of uh more voices and, and more people who are obviously as keen on playing cross league as we are which is uh that's a great plus i think for us mm-hmm. i think that the more we we grow the the, the people who are in the group now will have a much bigger say in things and um and we'll bring more people in. And I suppose we're looking for that sort of uh, tipping point, really, aren't we? That sort of exponential growth where we, we kind of explode. I don't think we're quite there yet, but I, I can see it coming based on the fact that, you know, of where we are now, you know? Yeah, and I think there's some good points made in that meeting that people were saying, uh, you know, we have to show people uh, the way to play the game, mm-hmm. you know, and that, and that it is a limited contact game and that it's about fun and it's about you know we often we've said it before like applauding your your opposition when they've done something good you know there, there's there's definitely scope for that now obviously when you're in a full-on full tackle competitive arena you don't get that very often but I, I you know I've been I've played in games in the past uh, full you know important games um, and you you know if somebody did something exceptional you could well have uh, the supporters of the other team um, applauding it, you know, uh, yeah. appreciating that it was good. And, uh, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, there seems to be a, from what I read on Facebook anyway, <laughs> there seems to be a move away to uh, everybody's crap except my team, which um, a, a move to that, sorry, and a, a move away from that appreciation of good football by the opposition and, you know, that you're appreciative of the game itself. Um, there seems to be a, a lot of spectators who uh, don't seem to buy into that. And that used to be the good thing, you know, one of the great things I thought about rugby league, that it had that, um, that people were there to see a rugby league game, not just to see their team win. Yeah, I think that that, that attitude of like, uh, what is it, like everybody who we beat is like rubbish and everyone who's better than us cheats that if you if you're yeah. going to look at the game through that kind of a lens um yeah you're not going to enjoy it much but also like then what happens if your team you know if your team stop cheating as it were and, and you do end up top of the table you do end up winning the super league um uh, right then everyone you've beaten is rubbish so what have you actually won whereas i think there's other sports where they build up the teams that they might be and they yeah. talk about their play and, and how great they are and how great certain players are on different teams and yeah. then that means that you've got that sort of uh, you know when you when you climb the mountain type of thing rather than just wading through a swamp which seems to be the you know that uh, that's the sort of the opposite of that I suppose you know? I, like I, I do think Pickney Rugby Union I do, you do hear that but they seem to at the All Blacks, every other team seems to think that the All Blacks oh. is this sort of like yeah. uh, unbelievable force, like something out of a film, you know. And like, yeah. and then they go and beat them, and it's like the best thing that ever happened. 
Um, but yeah. obviously they were beatable because they beat them. So yeah. I, I don't know. Like, mm. So there's, you know, there's a bit of a, maybe a lack of truth both ways, but it, it, it definitely serves better to, um, to build up your opposition more than it does to sort of take them away and make them like, no, no, we only lost because you did this or, or when we beat you, it's your rubbish. You can't even beat this team. You see that a lot, don't you? Like, um, People saying this team can't even beat that team. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. that's you've just put both teams down there and devalued yeah. the whole competition. And if you beat both yeah. of those teams, you, you know what? You won't, like I said. Yeah, so yeah, I, like, but if, you see Liverpool in, in soccer, Liverpool lost to the bottom of the table, Bournemouth, after the week before beating United, but he scored his seven against United. Like, mm. well, you know. I'm sure there'll be people out there saying, oh, well, that makes Bournemouth eight goals better than... Yeah, yeah. I just think that when you when you look at the, the game or the, the the attraction as a whole, you, you need to have an idea that you want to bring more people into the game. A bit like how we are with Cross League in general, but, you know, it applies to Rugby League too. Um, so, you know, like in, in, like in professional wrestling, you have this situation where, I mean, it's just a very formulaic, but you have that sort of idea of what they call like a monster heel who's like beating everybody. And then your yeah. good guy, you eventually, he gets like cheated out of it a few times and then you get up to the sort of main event and he wins. That's how it works. Like it's the, the great hero story, you know. But like yeah. if we're just going to be saying everybody's pathetic, you're never going to get that pay-per-view event because you're not building towards it. Yeah, so that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's us complaining about the fans again. I think we've done that a lot, don't we? So, <laughs> like, I, seem to, normal, I seem to remember practice. having this conversation before. Yeah, no, but when you open Facebook and you just bombarded yeah. with all this, you were rubbish and we were great. Just, yeah, uh, uh, well, as soon as it stops, we'll probably stop talking about it. It's probably the fairest way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, uh, the one thing that I would say that it also does, though, is it it, it poisons people against mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. just against the opposition for everything. So it's like if somebody gets injured, oh, he's just being soft. If your fellow injures them, uh, you know your fellow is like white and then white, and it was an accident, and you don't de you know you don't deserve getting any bans for that. And you just think, oh, come off it, will you? Like, I think that, like, did you see the in the Cowboys Broncos game? Uh, a shoulder to the head that broke your man's jaw. Your man's gonna be out for weeks. Like yeah. to me, without drink water, he should miss as long as the other as whoever. I can't remember what was his name. Corey, something in it. Corey. They're all called Corey, aren't they? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, but he should miss as many weeks as he misses with a broken jaw because it was a. At least a reckless hit, hit by the shoulder to the head. Yeah. You know, now I'm, in my day, you probably would have got got away with that as it was a bit of an accident. But uh, but still, I, I you know, if you're going to put somebody out of the game for a number of weeks, I think you've got to. Um, in that situation, yeah, the, the consequences really. Like, if you think, well, what should, what could he have done different? Well, he could have made sure he was a bit lower, and if he'd have gone a bit lower and not brought your man's jaw, then your man might have scored. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, well then that was good play on his part, and you didn't break the law by uh, breaking his jaw. And that, that's you know, live with that rather than thinking, well, I had to do, I had to do something. Yeah. Well, I think, but hopefully, sense will prevail online, and people will say, you know, that like when when he does get banned, which he should get banned, um, you know, it was uh, it was fair. But let's see, let's see how it plays out. Yeah, you can report back to us with that. Oh, well, then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, move on to this um, skill acquisition. Yep. Um, so just to sort of fill anybody in who's listening, uh, this is something that you found in, out in the wild of coaching. How did you find it? 
Uh, I, well, as I said, I stumbled, I stumbled across it, and I just, you know, read, just seen posts by people and what have you. And uh, Dan Costrell, who used to be the sort of, he seemed to be the first ever rugby coaching guru online uh, a good few years ago. Now there's other people trying to sort of uh, usurp him, I suppose, uh, and doing a very bad job of it, in my opinion. <laughs> But anyway, he, um, yeah, I just came across this. Uh, it's the Coaching Knife, uh, it's season 10 episode. It shows he's been going for a while. Season 10, episode 15 of the Coaching Knife, and it was uh, broadcast, I suppose, on March the 7th, 2023. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dan Cottrell talking to a guy called Job Franson, uh, who's a, a university lecturer and um. In Australia, oh, they did sound like he had a South African accent to me. Well, I actually um, had a look at his profile, and um, he he says that he speaks Flemish. So, uh, but he says well, Dutch, Dutch Dutch Flemish. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So who he could just be Dutch is correct. Yeah, um, I'm not yeah. sure. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was a like I had obviously I had a listen up to you, told me. And it, it's a it's a good conversation. And like yeah, like you say about uh, Dan Cottrell, he, he has been around for a long time. Like he used to do uh, like just emails, and those yeah. emails would link to you know he's a bit of a visionary in some ways. But mm. it's a, technology is a very strange thing in that if you set up with something, and then someone comes along later than you with a newer technology, they can sort of leapfrog you, can't they? And then I, I do feel like yeah. he's been. I, mean, I didn't know he was still going. But I see all yeah. these other guys all the time. I don't see him at all. I know. Yeah, and no, he, used to, no. he used to be the only guy you'd see in your email. But that, that, that world's yeah, moving. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, a, it's unfortunate. Uh, yeah, you can really get yeah, get leapfrogged is the that's the how I would describe it. But it, I mean, it happens, it happens yeah. in e-commerce. It happens in every form of technology, doesn't it? Like you know, like yeah. it's a it's that old uh, VHS, Betamax. You know, Nintendo sixty four, GameCube, all that yeah. kind of stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So anyway, in that they were they were talking about um, skill acquisition, mm-hmm. and uh, it's quite interesting, worth a listen if you can find it. Um, I'll try and link. It. I say that about everything, but I will. I literally will try and link this because obviously, okay. you know, that's only fair. You know. Mm, yeah, so I think what I've sort of just gone through it a little bit and uh, maybe done it a bit out of order. Not that I'm I'm out of order. I mean, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I've sort of written up a couple of things uh, the way I've sort of read it and listened to it, perhaps a little bit in the wrong order. Um, so, but I don't think it was one thing that, about the thing. It wasn't really linear. Linear. He didn't sort no. of say, "We'll start for me, and yeah, we'll start off with a novice, and we'll end up with an expert." He, but he, he did sort of talk about that, um, that, you know, what is scale and is the performance of action under a bit of pressure. Um, and that the describing the stages of skill acquisition, uh, which is like performance um, without awareness, then conscious competence, knowing whether you're any good at it, and then unconscious comp- competence, which is you're so skilled, you'll do it right every time without really thinking about it. Um, and uh, like I've, I've seen a slightly different model than that when I did the European um, rugby league coaching course. I think it had four steps rather than those three, but it's the same sort of thing, you know. It's that when you get to be an expert, you're doing it without really being conscious of, of doing things, you know. Yeah, can, uh, I just, uh, can I just jump in there because I, I I I heard that bit. I actually thought that is uh, not to be too critical, but I, I thought that the definition of a skill. I mm. found it a little bit uh, not clunky, but like it didn't probably cover everything that I would consider a skill. So, like, yeah. if I'm thinking of a skill, I'm like, well, uh, playing the guitar is a skill, and yeah, uh, and so I would say some skills are as sort of a means to an end in themselves. So, if we talk about playing the guitar, like you do it, there's composite skills of playing the guitar. So there's like strumming. Yeah. And there's like playing chords or playing notes, those kind of things. There's two other skills inside that skill that create playing the guitar. Yeah. And in rugby, I suppose, you have like there's some skills are just a means to them, particularly in this sort of more broken down 
version of both codes of rugby that we have now where people are just doing that one job their skill um it might just be one like you know the strumming or playing the notes with the the other hand type of thing because it's like i'm just going to carry i'm going to be good at carrying or i'm just going to pass i'm, I'm going to be a good yeah. passer but the i would say to be skilled a skill if being rug being good at rugby is a skill it's made up of a whole bunch of other skills isn't it so i i don't like yeah. i know you've got to draw a line somewhere of what a skill is but i would argue that it's more than what we said in like the performance of an action under yeah. some pressure yeah i i think so but I, I think you could spend perhaps a few hours describing skills uh, and describing what a skill is but it's it's just i mean he, he, it's the ability to do something. Yeah, it? it's com- competency. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Competence in an action, I think, would be considered. That's yeah, how, that's probably the most. Uh, any when you're competent in an action, so like you know, hanging out the washing or chopping a yeah. chopping yeah. vegetables or something like that. There's all skills in that. But then yeah. being a good yeah. housekeeper is another skill, and being a chef is another skill. And like it, yeah. you know, some of those things fit in, and some sk- skills are transferable and this kind of. Thing. Um, yeah. which I'll let you carry yeah. on and then I'll jump in with another well, it, route instead of mentioning that later on you know, uh, people who are uh, what you would call skilled athletes mm-hmm. who they've got agility they can jump over little hurdles and they can do the, their fast feet their SAQ stuff um, and they can maybe catch a static pass and throw a long spin pass to somebody but actually put them in a game of rugby and they just they can't do it they can't cope with it you know they do lots of things wrong and they become a weak link in that team and um, you know they, they really need to go away and work on their skills and the, the, the skills that they have that um, you know you think of the American football combined you know that that sort of stuff oh, they yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, I think you could, you know, you, I think some of that you could probably uh, score very highly in it and and turn out to be a flop. Yeah, well, there is actually a famous instance in there of uh, a, a guy who trained specifically for the combine, did all the oh, yeah. spent months, and then that, that's when I, I'm not sure if they changed it on the back of that or they just weighted it differently as uh in the draft but um yeah like he um he had unbelievably great scores but he was not like the he, sh- he should yeah. then if the if that was a true measure of being a very good American football player then yeah. he would be the best <laughs> he was yeah. so yeah no. yeah so um just sort of what he also talked about was acquiring skills and that mm-hmm. skills emerge and that you can develop skills. And he used that sort of the thing about an infant learning to sit up or reach or manipulate a toy, walk, talk, run, all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, move on to more complex movements that you might need for sport. And, and like we've just been saying that I, you know, my notes, I was sort of saying that uh, or to play a musical instrument, to ride a bike, or, you know, uh, there's there's lots of complex movements that um, we string together to improve our skills. Um, but like one of the things that Cranston said was that they you can um, you can acquire a skill, but that skill can disappear. And I just thinking I was uh, I was thinking of like you know people say about riding a bike, you know you never forget like that. But I did get a bike a few years ago, and I sort of had forgotten, not completely, but um, it took a while for me to get used to what I needed to do, all the coordination I need to do with the steering and the pedaling and, you know, um, especially sort of going up and down over pavements and stuff like that. It's something that you, if you don't do it for a while, you sort of lose it and you have to relearn it. So um, I think I, I would say that's why some people would probably say that um Oh, well, you do have to practice your static passing and you do have to do the absolute simple things repeatedly. But um, as I said, Franson went on to say that, um, you know, you, you thinking that way that two hours is better than one hour and four hours is better than two hours, 
doing a, an activity is an absolute nonsense, really, because you, you probably be better at taking the rest rather than uh, wasting your time on stuff that is uh, too sim- too simple and is already well established in your skill set. Yeah, I think that like the, those points that you just made there. So the the bit about uh, you made a point that a static pass is actually nothing like a pass on the run, so they're not going to translate. Um, so it wasn't sort of singling out certain people who say that it will, but he kind of was making that out to be a nonsense without being like uh, heavy-handed with it. Um, and then this, the thing about riding a bike is an interesting one. I think when people say the thing about riding a bike, like you, you never forget it, I think you just, the important part is that it's, uh, the momentum keeps you on the bike and that's the the principle of it. If you can, and you will always remember that. It's just having, it's actually having the trust that you're not going to fall off when you're going forward, but you might yeah. if you stay still. I, I think that's the, that's what people mean, isn't it? By by right about, but they, you know, you it probably is categorised as as a skill, but it's not. It's actually a bit of knowledge that you're not going to fall. Yeah. I think it's slightly different. Yeah. Um, but then yeah. uh, the other thing that seemed to come up quite a bit in the conversation was how how to acquire a skill, and I suppose that's the yeah. it's maybe the crux of this conversation. Um, yeah. And the thing that uh, they suggested in the beginning was, what if um, if you if you uh, just got a bunch of players of any sport, but let's just let's just say it's rugby, and a bunch of rugby balls and a bunch of cones, and you said, okay, learn rugby, they wouldn't know, they wouldn't acquire any skill that way. So you obviously have to do some kind of coaching, but the question is. Mm-hmm. How much and what should it entail? Yeah, so he, he does sort of mention that. He says, you know, like self-discovery has been shown to uh, not work um, because you can be wasting your time. You'll be doing the, you know, you, you if you did that, you put the, the stuff out, they, the lads could, um, they could make the pitch, they could set the pitch out using the balls and pass the cones around. Couldn't they? If they weren't told what to do, you know exactly, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know, you think of uh, AI that you know an AI machine might uh, that might come up with uh, if you hand it a list of things that it could use in the game, it might come up with a game that, um, like I say, you throw the cones around and you you kind of flags with the footballs. So it's uh, yeah, to, that that self unguided self discovery has been shown not to work. But uh, I think the, the big point that I thought was important that he said was that if you if you're using a if you if you're practicing a skill you know you're doing some sort of drill that or a little bit of a game uh, and you want your players to do something in that game or in that drill slightly differently than they have been doing and you tell them okay I want you to do this. Right. When he comes at you from that angle, I want you to do this or whatever it is. Um, hey, what are you saying is that like what tends to happen then is the coach goes back to the sideline, the activity starts up again, the lads start doing it, and the coach thinks, brilliant, I've I've taught them that and they know how to do it. But what he said is, but that isn't actually an acquired skill. There's they're still they're following what you've said and they're still in the constraints of what you've told them they can and can't do. Mm-hmm. It's only kind of it's only learned when they do when they make that decision to do that action that you've told them to do off their own bat. You know that it, it becomes part of their sort of armory of uh, options, and uh, they use it themselves. They select to do it themselves, and I think that's uh, that's a very key thing. It's a, it's something that I'd say that loads of coaches, myself included would really sort of uh, wouldn't appreciate that much that they'd be sort of oh no well the, the lads did it there so they must know it but uh, it's it's probably not true it's not true until they start uh, picking it out themselves so it can give you a false sense of uh, accomplishment as a coach that they're doing the thing that you asked them to do 
they're doing yeah, it. Yeah, so you think of that, I mean, how many times? How many times would you have sort of gone back? You know, you, you, I've coached you in the past, and how many times would I've we've sort of uh, we do something? I'd give what I think is a, a good tip, you know, to the players. We do it; it looks good. Next session that we do it, they all gone back to their old habits. Nobody's nobody's doing. Yeah, that. yeah, exactly. I, I think um, one of the things, if you were to be very honest about like that, let's let's just talk about like that tip that you gave, just um, whatever it was, right? Um, mm. That you might not see it if you were being truly honest about it. The tip that you gave. Uh, because we should be working in a kind of a uh, not a controlled environment, the actual game itself, an authentic environment, mm. then your tip might not, not come up. So it, it might be really disappointing as a coach because you would, you give it. And it's good advice, but as a player or as somebody trying to learn, I think you need to take that tip and not just try to show that you understood the tip. You need to go... Oh, well, it, it, this didn't call for that, that so I didn't do it. I'm not gonna, yeah. you know, like just perform based on what you what you've asked. I think I'd say the whole time that I was playing, probably never did that. Probably always tried to show that I understood what the coach was saying. If that makes sense, I think that's probably a track we all fall into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, it's, but well, I think it's a very, very important thing, and it's, it's. Uh, I think it's even, it's even worse when you, when you've done what a lot of people do with the, you know, the videos that you can find online now, the little reels and stuff, um, where somebody has decided a skill is made up by little sections, a bit like the, you know, I, I've, I've taught people to swim and that sort of whole part whole technique. Um, that you do with that, where you'd split it down into, or oh, just use one arm and a cone, or just use your leg kicks, or you know, um, I think that's a terrible way to to learn things. To be honest, when you're thinking about something that is a complex, uh, multi joint movement, you need to be doing the multi joint movements at the same time because uh, otherwise you you you're wasting time and effort. I think. So I think just, if you sorry, just I'm going to cut you off for a second. Can you just tell yeah. us about that? When you say whole part whole, do you mean okay? So yeah, what you what you tend what we were taught anyway, and maybe it's changed now. I don't know, but when I was at college, we taught to uh, teaching swimming that you sort of have a look at t- tell people to maybe swim uh, without much instruction, um, and then you'd sort of break that down and you'd sort of concentrate maybe on that session it with the say you're doing the front crawl that, that one arm movement of the front crawl so you might hold out a hold out a what do you call them? a float with one hand and just concentrate on the other hand whilst you're swimming you know and then you do you'd swap over and you do that other arm and then at the end of the session you'd sort of Say so, okay, I'll get rid of the floats, and we'll do. We'll have you swimming again. And it was hoping that you'd made some sort of improvement. But I, I don't know. I, I think particularly swimming is a difficult one, and I found it difficult to even learn because you've got that like where you you're unaware of your what you're doing really because you've got your head down in the water, you know. So yeah, yeah. it's not. You know, like you, when you're moving in in air, when you know you know where your hands are, you you've got that proprioception, that feeling yeah, of where yeah. you are. It's a bit of an element for us women. So I wonder um, if I wonder if the best swimmers also have an innate uh, like proprioception skill that's better than the average person. Yeah, I, it wouldn't surprise me. I think some of them have uh, extra flexible joints as well, and they're extra long limbs, and that's one of the sort of uh, that's the, you know they they do the technique and they're better than other people just because they've got that extra flexibility in their ankles or in their hips or in their shoulders uh, or they're five inches taller than anybody else or. Yeah, you know, I mean, you could even, you could even apply that down to sprinting with the um, yeah yeah you know. It does sort of come down. To, I think I saw a thing. You can correct me now if I'm wrong, but if um if a cockroach was the same size as a human, like six foot two or something, 
that it would win yeah. 100 meters in like it would run it in two seconds or something like that. Based on, yeah. based on the sort of like science of how it moves, the distance yeah. it moves now. Yeah. I mean, I find I that, do. I mean, I wouldn't want to see that or anything. Well, actually, I, I was really listening to another. But, uh, yeah, I was, I was listening to another science show, and they were talking about the uh, about the speed, of, the relative speed of other, other animals, you know. And like, you know, if you think of a cat, a house cat, you know, they they they, they tend to run off in different directions, wouldn't they? They wouldn't run a straight hundred meters, but a house cat would be a same bulb. Not not scaled up, not a no. six foot two house cat, an ordinary little cat. They're okay. faster than humans. Cats are faster than humans. I don't Hippo, think. hippos can run at like is it five miles an hour, forty kilometers an hour? They'd win the hundred meters as well. Clip that. Let's clip that. <laughs> <laughs> we got a minute left here, so I'm going to do a little break, and then we'll we'll come back for the second half. And we are back. So. To summarize, so far we found out a few things: house cats and hippos and cockroaches are really fast. <laughs> but let's get back to the the, the skills. Uh, yeah, I think one of the other the, the other terms that I'm not fully familiar with, and I'm sure other people maybe are too, is that you talk a lot about uh, open and closed skills, which I think um, Franson also references. Um, can you just define what you mean by that? Well, that, uh, yeah. Open the skill is the more sort of variables that are to you performing it. So whether that's weather conditions, uh, the pitch conditions, or the condition how the ball comes to you, uh, how close the opposition is. Uh, so when you when you've got this, where you've got to you've got to perform the skill of passing. You know that's why the you know the, obviously his hit upon passing has been particularly. Uh, no, you know, good passing done by a skilled person on the run compared to um, static passing. You know, you, it, static passing has very few variables. You, I mean, I, I, I see some videos and th this is, you know, it's a very close skill. They've, what they've done is they've, they've got very few variables. They're telling this person to pass it in a certain way. Uh, and yet they're... Um, the passes very seldom are being caught in exactly the same place by the receiver. And like for me, that's the whole point of bringing it right down is that you can say, right, well, if I pass it this way, it's going to have exactly the same outcome. And yet they don't seem to bother to correct somebody who throws it high to the left or down lower than their waist or out to the right. And yet they're like, oh, yeah, there you go. You're doing it. That's good. Well, it's not good. You know, you've you've made it easy for them because you've cut out all the variables. You've made it a closed skill almost, and yet you're not bothered about their income. The the outcome. It's a bit like, say, if you said to a a dart player, "Yeah, just hit that board anywhere. <laughs> not bothered. Just anywhere on the board. That's grand. Yeah, there you go. You've got that skill. That's not a skill, is it? Like, no. Well, it's not the it's not the skill that you. Need. I think this is this is, I suppose, part of the the puzzle that uh, maybe people are missing it's not like hitting the dartboard absolutely anywhere is not the um that's not how you win a dart and passing a ball absolutely to any direction is not going to be how you will eventually win at uh at yeah. so, so just to sort of summarize I, playing the guitar would be considered a closed skill you're getting the guitar and they sound pretty much the same all the time uh, an open skill would be if uh, if I I set out to learn how to play nearly every stringed instrument, and I would be adaptable, and I would say, well, actually, this violin, you do even though the principles are similar, I need to do this. And so, if I, if I want to be a good stringed instrument player, I need to play lots of different stringed instruments. And if I wanted to be a good guitar yeah. player, I would just play the guitar. Is that sort of what you're saying? Well, yeah, there is that, but I, well, I think what you might, people might argue with you that if you were, say, playing uh, tabs or sheet music, um, playing that on your guitar, where 
the outcome is supposed to be you hit every note and the every note lasts that length of time, um, then yeah, that's that's a close skill because you're trying to repeat that and you don't have somebody keep pushing into you. <laughs> you know, like you're able to sit and play that that music. Um, but if you say you were, you know, a bit of a like you went off on guitar solos and uh, then obviously you're still skilled, like um, Jimi Hendrix. You might still be skilled, but you might play it different every time. So you know, I think I saw, I thought I saw something with Mark, Mark Knopfler. Well, yeah, but like Mark Knopfler was on something once over, and he was saying that uh, you know he loved playing things and he loved changing things up a little bit and diff, you know slightly different. And like his wife said to him, like you yeah, know, the reason why this isn't going down that well. Is because people want to hear it exactly what they yeah, <laughs> what they're used yeah. to in the world. Yeah, they want to hear the, the recorded version. The stress of, of the uh, note at the time that they know that the stress of yeah, the note is yeah. made on the recording. Yeah, they're, they're they're you, you sound great if you do that. Where he's thinking, well, I'd rather you know do a little bit of a flow here, a little bit of that. And he sort of said, like, I've got rid of all that now, and I just try to play it exactly as I sort of play down the record. That must be. A nightmare if you don't think that what's on the record is your best take. I'd imagine. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're almost making, you're almost sort of emphasizing what you probably see as an imperfection. Like it's, it'd be to give it an equivalent. It would be like to be honest. I think that's what he was saying to him. He thought yeah. he could play it better than it is on yeah, the on yeah. the record, but that's mm-hmm. not what people wanted to hear. So if you go back to I passed you through that wasn't great, but was caught, and that and you ended up scoring. I, the team ended up scoring, and you think, yeah. oh, I, I wish I'd have done that a bit better. And if I had to do it again, if I had to perform that again, I'd have, yeah, I'd have put it there, or I used that different spin, or I'd have, you know, done the end over end, or I might have flicked it with my fingers or whatever. Um, yeah, but, but I suppose the thing about us as rugby players is that we don't get a chance to go and reperform that same thing whereas I suppose they do yeah which they do as guitar players although probably there was times in your life you would like to have had another chance to throw a bass or another chance to partake in the scoring or the try you just don't get that luxury I suppose no no and it, you know the um, that's why I would be very much the uh, proponent, in other word, of uh, playing games because they, they they just throw all these variables at you, and you need to be able to cope with those variables in order to get that pass away. No, no two passes are exactly the same, so there's no point practicing them as as if they are. Um. So, like, what what this all sort of led. Uh, me to to think is that the what you don't want obviously is unguided um, self discovery because you don't you don't discover how to do it as as we've already said. Um, so what you need is a game. You don't want a, a drill. I mean, he did say I don't know everybody's sort of so uh, against drills, but you know he wants to look at the drills that are being put yeah. up online. I'm sure he'd say, yeah, well, I didn't mean that drill because that is rubbish. Yeah. You know? yeah. I would um, argue that 95% of all drills need to do it away with right now, starting with yeah. truck and trail. Like, yeah. It's just horrendous. Oh, the, the boxes and the squares and the run to the middle. I mean, I I, I hated them when, when they came in to, to rugby league. I had a much, you know, our, one of the things we did when I was, a, was younger was like, we play touch rugby basically for ages, you know, and it was, it did have that element of a game, didn't it? Okay, perhaps wasn't great because we were only playing touch, but it, uh, it just had that element of a game. And, and you know, one of the things that he does go on to say is that um, repeating a skill doesn't give you that sense in your head of sequencing, the sort of sequencing that you would have in a game. You know, because like you're not going to go, okay, left hand spin pass five meters, left hand spin pass five meters, left hand. You, you're going to go, left hand spin pass, 
right hand short pass that I don't spin, uh, or we've lost possession. I've got to make a tackle. So it, you know, the, the sport is tends to be that sort of invasion sport. It's all about uh, the sequence of back and two, and you have possession, see what you can do with it. Then you're defending, you know, and it's uh, it's very different from this like or. Oh, do that pass for 20 minutes, do that pass and drill for 20 minutes. Yeah, just like on that, I saw two videos. One of them was from some novice rugby union thing. I hope it was anyway, uh, where they were going. They'd set up two almost like malls facing like back to back. And there was a guy and he was joining the mall to give a bit of oomph. And then he turn around and join the other one that was the drill it was like him going from mall to mall uh which is i mean what kind of a game is that and then the other thing was and i'm pretty sure this was from i'd say it was like one of the super rugby teams and it was that drill you've probably done where you have make a tackle on a bag but fully finish it off knock the guy down get up go into the other grid knock that guy down come out you know and I was yeah. thinking, thinking back to, I remember one time, I think it was once the youths, and like we did a bit of that. And then, you know, I think, I think some of them, oh, you know, you'd be used to this playing would be me, you know, as if I was mm. making six tackles in every set, like hey, yeah. on my yeah. own, six individual yeah. tackles. Um, mm. But like, because I think that was, it was six, you know. Then you, then yeah, you yeah. People were getting like, you know, some people were getting really hurt by it. Some people were struggling with the fitness of it. But and I mean, that's understandable. It never happens. If if you did no. that, why are we training for the highlight reel? Why don't we train for the game? Do you know what I mean? If you made six tackles yeah. on the trot like that as one on one tackles, it'd be like, um, you know, you'd be all over social media. It'd be like yeah. one of the most amazing things that ever happened. Like, I did. I did notice Marty Tapau made uh, four out of five in a set um, to the day. The Broncos against he's playing for the Broncos now, isn't he? So the Broncos against the Cowboys. Uh, and I, I would have my like, occasionally I'd be critical of him, uh, but he definitely put effort in. And you know, some of them were like third man, but other yeah. like I think he made at least. I think he was either the first or second man in at least three. Out of the five tackles, yeah. uh, and nearly like yeah, well, out of the four tackles, yeah. So he, you know, he did. So it was a good effort, but it was you knew like, well, he's going to be walking back for this next set. He's not going to. He's not yeah. going to take one of the next the ones. The thing is, it's like, you, you notice, you like you notice that. So you know what I mean. Like this isn't not yeah. everyone is doing. Yeah. You know, like and I think, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and not everyone. Yeah. And the other thing about it is, it's just. Your positioning when you get back, it's not like you run back and you're like some sort of berserker yeah. and you're just gonna launch. Well, the I mean, it, yeah, you've got the, to. The reason, the reason oh. he got to have to do that is because he went to Matt. He stayed at Mark. Yeah, exactly. So, like the 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 thing that seems to be missing about those drills. First of all, you got no support, so the tackle is a little bit different. Mm. Secondly, the it's a bag carrier who is running at you in order to dive backwards. So. Again, very unrealistic. The, yeah. When you get into position, you're not getting into position in in a natural way like you would in a game where you're you're gonna you know find the spot that you need to be in. You're just running back into another grid, launching yourself. The next day. look, it's fantastic as a physical exercise. I bet you burn lots of calories. Yeah. But like, does it help? I don't think it does necessarily help. No. 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 So. I think what, what we we're building to the, the crescendo of um, is that <laughs> is that all of this everything everything I think about um, skill acquisition and why drills are not very good compared to games and why over conditioned games are not very good because you don't know what is their actual learning going on it it sort of, in my head it's sort of reinforced my assertion that uh, cross league is a great game for skill acquisition. And the reason it's so good is because it mimics the sort of spatial pressure that you have, the, you know, the distance between you and the, and the defender. 
the defenders coming at you in the same sort of way that they would to make a, a proper tackle. So that's an that's another sort of bonus that you you know your your observation of where the defense is and where your own players are are the same that you can just move them up to a to a real game. Um what you don't have, and I mentioned this in that uh, the talk I gave to the what was it Royal Royal Society of Medicine Society about medicine, the, yeah. that um you know, you're, you're learning to do these skills without the pressure of uh, somebody going to knock you knock you over. You know, you're not going to get hurt. So you can, you know, it's a, again, it's a, it's this spatial awareness and it's when to pass and how to pass and how to deliver that pass. Um, and it's also, it's a small-sided game, so that increases your um, participation level. If you've got, you know, 15 players on a, on a pitch or 13 players on a pitch you might only touch it four or five times a game you know whereas if you've only got seven likely that ball's sort of going to uh, go through your hands more often um, for for us for, for cross league that's sort of the fact that it isn't particularly aerobically challenging means that you can still perform because you're not absolutely burnt out you can like you would be maybe in a full game you can still perform your skills. Uh, and, and like I said before, the seats in that Franson said is an important thing and an important difference between drill and the game. Um, that's that's another thing that, uh, that Cross League has because, you know, you have possession and then you have to defend. You have possession and you have to defend. And it's this sort of uh, pick, it's, it's the skill selection from the internal intrinsic skill selection that you try to do that uh, makes that makes that game so much better than just being told what to do in a drill. So it's um it ticks a I lot think... of boxes. I'm just looking at your your notes so and that's pretty much what you said there. The so the um I think the for me the spatial pressure uh I I feel like all the way through my learning to play from age of 12, where we're playing touch and it's one handed and it was like left upon rugby and it was just taking pass type of thing. So, no real rub, no real onside, no real setting up. Um, just an invasion game similar to Bulldog, but with a ball kind of almost, you know. Uh, and yeah. then moving up to uh, like through the sort of West Munster, Munster, and then Ireland at Rugby Union. Unless we were playing, I didn't really experience the uh, accurate spatial pressure. No. I think, you know, like, it, it, I never felt that I was in a game, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, what, I mean, the other thing is, like, some people, like, I, I, I like touch, I think it has, it has definitely, it's kind of really... Um, big part to play in development as a, as a kid but I think it needs to be controlled in such a way that it's beneficial and not about quick rooks and, and you know it needs to be applicable to so your best side of the market but when we play when we play touch with um, I won't say who it was but there's rugby union decent level game of touch and I was like I felt it's almost sick afterwards because they'd devalued the game so much. Like they were just laughing and joking. And I was like, it's disgusting. This is one of the opportunities we all have to like play against each other and organize ourselves and get everything right. And you just like, you know, it was that sort of situation where two fellas who kind of know each other keep running, trying to run around each other. And I was like, yeah. that's yeah. not who's, you know, like, like who's sure. doing that and why and who's allowing that to happen you know and yeah i think that, yeah. like that and and similar thing here weirdly enough like uh, when, when i was playing uh like uh the brisbane competition or whatever playing touch at the start of the start of the session and fellas just going uh, like getting the tackle count wrong deliberately like just saying it's last tackle after two tackles and this kind of thing and just really <laughs> Breaking this, that sounds hilarious until it happens yeah. for the third or fourth time, 
and then it's like <laughs> you, it's you, now I'm like thinking, are you are you using this as a way of getting better at playing rugby league, or are you just here for the for the crack, you know? Yeah. And, and like yeah, I, I yeah. just yeah. I was just gonna pull a Roy Keane and just leave. In fact, that is what I did. I think. <laughs> yeah. Side yeah. pandem. Yeah, side pandem. I, I just like I don't I don't understand this attitude, you know, like does it like touch as I said, if you control it right and you can put in the you know the, the right constraints for like learning, I think it can be a fantastic game for uh, for a squad. Um I mean like not to sort of put too fine a point on it, but isn't like cross league is the ultimate training game in the that's the one with the right constraints. So you know, yeah. I, obviously, I would choose that. And I have done for ever since you, you came up with it or whenever that was, like in two thousand two or something like that. So like I wasn't that old, but it, when I went any time I'm coaching, I'm going to do this. But uh, yeah. I have been in situations where I wasn't calling the shots and. We were playing half baked games of uh, of uh, bulldog or whatever, which was just yeah. No yeah. I think I think the the one key thing I suppose is that um, what you want at each sort of cross league club, um, who you know, anybody that is playing it, it's a. I, I think the the game itself helps people on the road to self discovery. So there's. There's not that you can improve your skills without actually any coach telling you what to do. What I think I found with our group um, is that by me telling people, oh, you did that and it worked, they try it again at another, you know, at another time, they'll try it again and they'll try it, you know, and it, it does become, it does become part of their uh, skill set. Uh, and if it, and instead of me sort of saying, "Oh, di- you did that that time," I want you to do exactly that again, and then not really knowing how they did it, it's that sort of, like I said, it's that self discovery that you, if you keep creating the situations, then people start doing stuff that they've all that they've had a success with, whether that's defending or whether that's attacking. But it's it sort of increases their their knowledge and increases their sort of experience and then that sort of helps them to deliver that skill better and more often um and without needing much coaching so i think it's the the nature of cross league the sort of the fact that we've got things right um with the the spatial awareness and the um the amount uh, you know the amount of involvement you have and all that sort of thing uh, that's what makes it such a good game and it, it even if you're not the best coach in the world just running that game and sticking to those rules can make your players better. Yeah, I was actually just going to say that as you were talking. I, some people would probably say, you know, like the you as a coach who was relying heavily on this game in order to, for people to to get to you know skill acquisition through a form of self discovery, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, that that in some ways is less hands on, and like you're being lazy, or that you're, uh, yeah, and that uh, you know you're not. I suppose you're not putting in lots of effort that um, that a coach is maybe expected. But I suppose the real question is why? Why are we expected? Why? Why do we have to put in like and this amount of effort where you're where you're uh, changing of people's running style and you're interfering with the way people are carrying a ball and you're going down to a, a micro level uh, on some things and like when you could do all this from you know a much higher level yeah, I suppose yeah, a macro think, level if that makes sense yeah I think part of that is the uh, like we mentioned it in the previous podcast or one of the previous podcasts uh, American Sport you know, mm-hmm. that it's so much controlled and stats, you know, uh, are so important. And it's the it's the coach just moving players who have exactly the same attributes of the fellas they're playing against and uh, just moving around like chess pieces. And yeah. um, and then obviously the, the growth of sports science um, that has 
said, well, we can, you have to do it this way in order to be successful. You've got to lift these weights. You've got to run these things. You've got to do this SAQ stuff, you know, and like there's, there's loads of time spent in gyms and uh, on tracks and what have you. And uh, there's actually no, no real skill being shown. You know, apart from this, yeah, to not fun. That's, a, that's another thing I was going to ask you because when this came up, I was actually doing. You know, I do the Cooper test on the uh, on the mm. cross trainer all the time, and you know, I like to like to cheat. You know, you have to keep it between sixty and, and eighty, and I yeah. let it I let it go down, but not far enough for the thing to kick me out, and then I and then I, so I I put it back into the right zone. Like that's how I that's how I get to the end. You know, uh, but I was yeah. it was going to ask. Do you think me time in that run where I let it go so I can rest and then build it? Is there a skill in that, or is that just is that to the side of it being a skill? Or like, did I acquire that skill, or is it just something that's really obvious, like pouring a glass of milk, which in itself is a skill, but it's a very basic one. Uh, I would say that you know, in a way, you're like the guy that cheated on the combines. That you didn't cheat. You just uh, yeah, you, know, you, you just made the most of like uh, what your your knowledge of how the system works. But yeah. it, it's it's a bit like uh, it's a bit like say uh, you know back in my playing days, I'd make a quick decision as to whether I'd be able to catch somebody or whether I wouldn't bother me ask to run after them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so and uh, like I'm even better at you know because I know I'll never make it, so I never bother. <laughs> The answer but, is always no. But, but the the usual times when I definitely knew that I could get there, yeah, and that was yeah. a sort of a flashed up in my, you know, that guy's. I'm giving him five yards start over fifty. I'm going to get him, mm. you know. Um, but like, I think that I, that was the thing we were actually discussing about putting the ball down uh, with your mum of all people <laughs> to score a try. The other day, and uh, I said, you know, a lot of times I just actually touched it down rather than dived to score, mm. uh, because often people had stopped chasing me in that yeah. same sort of thing. They were like, "Why would I? I'm not wasting effort running after this fella. He's all, he's definitely going to score. So why should I put in a thirty meter sprint for nothing?" Mm. That I just have to recover from afterwards. So it's the same sort of thing with you. You know, you why should you? Why should you push it? Why should you push yourself to be at that certain level, um, higher than you need to be? You know yeah. that's. Um, well, I, that's... I suppose the thing with with the Cooper test is that if I can't go over eighty either, because that will push me out. So I have to yeah. stay with yeah. it. On. So I, I'm I'm going to say in some ways, it's, it's a skill. skill. It's, it's a basic skill, isn't it? You know. Um, but, then, a, yeah. but then my my sort of. I don't know if you've probably answered this already, but then there are skills. I think when I think of skills, I think of tackling, passing, just like sidestepping, drawing, that kind of thing. But there yeah. are also the like the physical skills of, of knowing when to put in an effort and where to put that effort. Yeah. And and there's a skill to that too. But in a lot of ways, well, that... as we talk about it, that does sound it sounds quite basic and obvious. Like, but it's 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 what you'd sort of call reading the game, isn't it? Mm, you know, yeah. it's like when when people go to people go to dummy half and are they going to run or are they going to pass? You know, they're they're picking up cues, aren't they? They're uh, so it's uh, I mean, like Darren is when he goes to marker. If you're playing against him, you know you've got to pass it away because if you take any bit of a step, he just comes and gets you. Like he he, he times it right where he'll just jump out and get to you. So, you know, if you aren't aware of that, you get caught that easy. So that's a skill in itself, recognising who's at marker. So I suppose uh, I, I've actually inadvertently talked myself into that Cross League is also brilliant for those skills that I would consider just the, the sort of reading the game, basic skills, because you're not going to be able to... Uh, I didn't do that deliberately. Uh, you're not going to develop that skill in a drill or a standing and passing. No, uh, that, 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 exactly. play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When when the when the constraints are on the you know the defenders or whatever, and 
you're exploiting the constraints. You're not actually, you know, you, I mean, I hate doing drills where you sort of say, oh, yeah, you've got to stay on that line. You can only move sideways. Mm, yeah, because yeah. It's like, well, well, you wouldn't only move sideways. And the, yeah. the, the pass has got to work out when they pass it. And if you yeah. were saying, okay, well, you can, you can run right up to that line and pass it. I mean, even then, what happens a lot in those drills, when you say the defender can only move sideways, he still intercepts it. Yeah. Or he still gets hand to it, or it, you know, the, so like you might as well have said no restraints, like and just put a bit more pressure on them because they, they they're probably going to get it wrong quite a bit first. And as I said, that's the, that's the thing I've done with uh, cross league. I've let people make errors and tried to point out when they've done things well uh, that ah oh, that worked, didn't it? Yeah, and we and we as a group can do that again with you playing your part. In that. And that's the sort of limit, really, I think, that you need to be doing as a as a cross-league coach. You need to be sort of letting people identify what they can do and just keep encouraging them to do it. I mean, if you think of that's that was the, the sort of uh, the method that we used at the uh, the Irish team. That yeah, yeah, just to identify a, a, you know, yeah, something that's brilliant and, uh, and emphasise. Yeah, so I think if, if you were to draw a coaching manual for cross league, it would be you could probably fit it on one page. Is it a lot of yeah. your? I, I think adhering to the rules and being very yeah, strict that, about that and not complaining is you know so that you get a quality yeah. game and a quality use of your time would be ninety percent of it, and then the rest would be, uh, you know, um, observe, Keep. see where the good stuff is, yeah. and emphasize it. And then and try yeah. to keep that and maximize that by keeping the games going and flowing and, and maybe keeping your sides as fair as possible too in order to create that um, yeah. like uh, you know competitiveness. Yeah, that it's a, a com- competition. Like yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, I think that's that that's so true. And it's um I do think, you know, it, it's a very good game that people should be using. And um I hope more people do. So that's the, I suppose, that was a review of the the rugby knife using the cross league fork. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And we've all had a great time. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to close it up there, I think. Um, Yeah, Yeah. uh, so we'll we'll endeavour to try and get uh, another subject for uh, the next next time which i think actually will be i think it'll be in a few weeks time now because we're a little bit banked up with uh, this release probably won't go out for a couple of weeks uh, and then i think it's a really busy time for I'm, I'm away for a little bit we might do one when i'm in america let's see i'm not sure oh yeah yeah, yeah. Um, we might be able to find the time uh, from dallas that'll be good i'll have to record a different intro just a little note on the intro i didn't know this but it'll be probably happy to hear that you know we, we use the pokes uh, yeah. Insta. So I was just chancing my arm that we could get away with that, but it's uh, it's it, it's flagged up as copyright, but it's uh, it's fair use on YouTube. So I don't know who's responsible for that, but thanks. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, it, it's it's actually there's a mark on every video saying that that's um, that's okay. Really? Even, even, with the, even with the intro overlaid on top of it, they managed to identify that. You'd think there'd be a better use of yeah. this kind of technology, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, did, I did buy that album, so we should be able to play it whenever we want. Yeah, and I've got Spotify Premium, so surely between the two of us, we've got the right. <laughs> anyway. Catalog. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you go. And, uh, All right. Yep. We'll talk uh, another time. All right. Yep. Thanks very much. Good night. Bye bye. <laughs>